Good morning, everybody. This is Thomas Felder and Pastor Anthony Burrell. We are here for another edition of our Daniel and Revelation Bible series. Today, we are covering Revelation 13, Revelation 13, which is considered to be probably one of the most critical chapters in the whole episode uh, that we find in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. The caption for today's Bible study is the beast, the image, and the mark of the beast. So if you are joining us today online, I'm asking you that you share, 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 and like and share this Bible study. This is going to turn out to be one that your friends and family are going to want to see. Everyone is very concerned nowadays. There is fear and panic in the air with regard to what is this mark. The Bible says that there will be a punishment for people who receive the mark, a, a punishment from God when we get to Revelation 14. So we better know what the mark is, and we better consider it based on God's word. You will never know what the mark is unless you know who the beast is. Is that okay? Let's pray and jump into it. Of course, we never have enough time, and we're going to do what we can to make use of the time that we have. Father in heaven, be with us for the next few moments. Hide us behind the cross, and we pray, Father, that you will be lifted up and that all men will be drawn to you. We ask these and so many more blessings in your holy son, Yahshua, Jesus Christ, the Messiah's name. Amen, amen, and amen again. Amen. So again, the, the name of today's Bible study is the beast, the image, and the mark of the beast. And the general theme, the general theme that we're going to cover today is the rise, reign, ruin, resurrection, and restoration of the beast. So if we had to summarize the today's entire Bible study, it would be those five words. The rise, reign, the ruin, the resurrection, and the restoration of the beast. There's something to keep in mind that the beast that we're going to run into in a few moments is the same beast that we saw in Daniel chapter 7. So if you saw our Bible study on Daniel 7, great. There will be some things that we won't have time to get into today. You can go to Daniel 7's um, Bible study for 2021, and it'll list the things that we don't have time. We had to be selective. There's a lot of information to cover. But let me give you some high points about the beast of Revelation 7. I mean, sorry, the beast of Daniel 7, what it has in common with this beast in Revelation 13. It is the same beast. The first thing is that the beast is blasphemous, blasphemous. Mm. It basically says that it is a God man. It is a God man. It has God-like powers. It has the ability to forgive men of their very sins. It has the ability wow. to change God's commandments. So these are some of the things that, that make it blasphemous, blasphemous. The second thing is that it persecutes the saints. The same power persecutes the saints for 1,260 years. This power persecuted the church in the form of the papacy. But, but even before that, it, it, per, it persecuted the church through, through pagan Rome. It fed them to the lions in the arena. They turned them into human torches. The same power. The Bible says that this, this last phase or the greatest phase of this power was 1,260 days. And days in prophecy equals years. So the 1,260 days that it reigned was equivalent to 1,260 years. We find that in Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6. Those are just two verses that actually give you the day for a year principle in prophecy. Now, this last beast, the one that we're going to talk about, arises out of a divided Roman Empire. And it has uh, Rome, pagan Rome, gives it its power, its seat, and its great authority. So the emperors, in 538, the emperors turned over the keys of Western Rome, literally, to the Bishop of Rome, right? And they moved their kingdom to Constantinople, right? Turned the keys of the kingdom over to him. And it also arises out of a divided Roman Empire. Remember, Rome broke up into 10 pieces, and, and this little horn comes up out of it. Remember we talked about it in Daniel 7? And it comes on the end of some other empires. The lion, the bear, the leopard all come before 
this horn rise up, before this beast power rise up. The, the lion was um, Babylon, the bear was Medes and the Persians, the lepers was the Greece, and then of course we had this incredible beast uh, that had uh, teeth of iron and it had claws of brass. One thing that the Bible does make clear over and over that this last beast is diverse or is different than all of the other beast powers that came before it. It was different. What made it different? All of these powers were, were headed up by God men, men who wanted to rule the state, meaning the politics, but also rule the religion. So what makes this last beast so different? Well, this beast, unlike the other nations, claims that its religion is the religion of Christ. Mm. That is the twist on it. Every other empire was trying to destroy the church from the outside, but this last power claims that it is inside the church and it is doing it with God's authority. Are you with me? That's why Daniel was so overcome. And he said, who can destroy this beast? Right? And we find in Revelation, it says, who is like this beast? So it's interesting to note that when we left off in the previous chapter, the dragon was wroth with the woman. Remember, he was chasing her in, in uh, Revelation 12. Well, in Revelation 13, he catches up. <laughs> he catches up to her. When we get to Revelation 14, the question is, what should the church do in response? What hmm. is the church supposed to be doing with all this is going on? So when we get to Revelation 14, the Bible says that we, the church, are supposed to make a particular trumpet sound. We are supposed to make a declaration when we see these things going on. It is commonly called the three angels' messages. We will get to that tomorrow. All right, so that's your high-level overview. Let's jump into it. And of course, there's no better place to start with the Bible than the actual text. Pastor Morell, if you could be so kind as we go to um, Revelation 13, 1, if you could read the actual text on the screen. Amen. Revelation 13, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. All right. Um, we're going to chew through this kind of quickly. And, and Pastor Morrell, feel free to, to add some commentary. I'm trying to leave some space in some other areas. But again, uh, the seven heads, the seven heads on this, this particular beast, it comes out, out of a, um, a populated area. We find that in Revelation 17, uh, verse 15. It has seven heads. Well, what are those seven heads? The seven heads are the nations that have tried to destroy God's people since the beginning of the biblical age, right? Those were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medes and Persians, Greece, the Roman Empire, and then the Roman Empire revived, which is the papacy, right? Remember Egypt was the first one to put the, the children of Israel into slavery, right? Once, once God had declared them a nation, they put them into slavery. Assyria came next, mm -hmm. and they took the, the um, 10 tribes of Israel, Babylon comes behind them and takes the two remaining tribes, um, Judah and, and Benjamin, puts them in slavery. Then we had the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, etc. These seven heads also match up with the four kingdoms, right? So there were four kingdoms that we found in Daniel 7. Those four kingdoms were Babylon, Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Roman Empire. So there is a, 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 um, a lining up an alignment between the seven heads and four kingdoms. So again, you'll see this term seven heads later on in the Bible study. You know that part of the seven heads were those four kingdoms. So each nation was ruled over by God kings, men who believed that they were God and also were ruled the civil power. We talked about that at length, won't spend too much time there. But God kings demand worship, men who want to rule church and state. Remember Nebuchadnezzar told the boys to bow down? And, and then later on, somebody threw Daniel in the lion's den. So these kings demand worship. In the last days, our government, the government who ultimately rules the world, will command worship, literal worship. Mm. This, this chapter, Revelation, is all about worship. Remember we talked about God in his throne room and, and the uh, angels bowing down and the elders bowing down and the, 
the cherubim bowing down. And ultimately, when we are saved, we will do what? Bow down. It's about worship. Right? So the next thing it had was uh, ten horns. It was seven, seven, king, seven kingdoms. And it had ten horns. Right? When we get to the last beast, it has uh, seven heads and ten horns. Well, what were the ten horns? The ten horns, when Rome was broken up, it was broken up into ten sort of states, ten states or many nations, smaller parts. And of those 10 states, three of them were destroyed. The Heruli, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals. We spent time uh, going over these when we talked about the trumpets. And, and seven of them remain. Um, Germans, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, and Brita, Britain. And during the days of early Rome, they were called the Alemanni, or the Huns, the Franks, the Vistagoths, the Suevi, the Lombards, the Burgundians, and Anglo-Saxons. So the seven heads still remain, the seven of the 10 seven of the 10 horns, sorry, still remain, right? You're very familiar with them. Yesterday, we talked about the dragon, right? And Pastor Burrell did a great job. I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. He talks about the different phases of, of Satan. You know, he says in one phase, he comes as a serpent, he comes as a dragon, he comes as a deceiver, he comes as Satan. And, and Pastor Burrell, maybe he'll recap that later on, but he, he laid that out phenomenally. But I want to tell you why this dragon language is so important. In the Bible, in Ezekiel 32, 2, and I'm moving quickly here, this is um, the prophet speaking, and he's talking about Egypt. He says, you are like a dragon in the seas. You burst forth in the rivers. You trouble the waters with your feet and foul the rivers. Hmm. He is talking about Egypt, and he's talking about Pharaoh and how the Pharaoh stomp around, and they muddy God's, God's word, right? Because his word is living water. And he says, it says like, this is Proverbs 25, 26. It says, like a muddy spring or a polluted well is a righteous man who gives way to the wicked. So dirty water mm. represents a righteous situation mm. that gives way to the wicked, Proverbs 25, 26. I'm going to tie this together in a second. Just bear with me. In Jeremiah 46, verse 8, it says, um, it's talking about Egypt. It says, I will rise and cover the earth. I will destroy the cities and their people. This is uh, the Pharaoh Egypt talking about it. Um, talking about what he was going to do to God's people. And Egypt rises, Egypt's main focus is always the Nile. It is always the Nile. It's where its life source comes from. It is a city that has a river running through the middle of it. Babylon was a city that has a river running through the middle of it. Its strength is its river. When we get to heaven, it is the holy city. God's throne is dead smack in the middle. And there's a river that comes out of his throne. The strength of the city is in the river. There is a tree of life that is fed from the river. This is important. Remember, the alligator or the crocodile muddies the water, the life source. Isaiah 27, verse 1, it says, In that day, the Lord will take his sharp, great, and mighty sword and bring judgment on Leviathan, mm -hmm. the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent, and he will slay the dragon of the sea. Isaiah 27, verse 1. So wow. when you see the word Leviathan, it means dragon. When you see serpent, it means dragon. When you see crocodile, it means dragon. And this was the symbol of Egypt, right? It's a symbol of Egypt. Why does that matter? Hang on. In Psalms uh, 74, verses 13 and 14, it says, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the water. Uh, Ezekiel 29 verse 3 says, my river is my own and I have made it for myself. This is Pharaoh. And this is the prophet Ezekiel speaking about Pharaoh, what Pharaoh is saying. He says, I made this river and I made it for my own glory. In response, Isaiah says in 31 verse 3, because the, uh, the children of Israel are now afraid of, of Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh's symbol was the crocodile? When they first started to draw dragons, it was nothing more than an alligator with wings, meaning that Pharaoh says, I not only control the water, because that's where crocodiles, they run, they control the water, but they're also comfortable on land, just not as fast. But Pharaoh says, and the devil says, I won't just control the water or the land, I'm also going to control the air. God says that he controls the heavens, the earth, and the waters. Here is Pharaoh going head to head with God about his territory. So Isaiah reminds them that the Egyptians are men and not God, right? 
Pharaoh says in Exodus 5, 2, Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord and I will not let Israel go. Why did I give you this background? Because you got to understand that serpent talk, dragon talk is opposite to what God says. And it is all about getting worship, worship. And that's what Pharaoh was about. Ultimately, this dragon symbolism, every time we see it, I want you to think about Pharaoh who says that he wants to control the earth, the water, and the sky, right? That is God's territory. Let's pick up at verse, verse two, verse two. And it says, Pastor Burrell. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of the bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. All right. Pastor Burrell, you can, you can come here if you like. Otherwise, I'll just keep pressing forward until you want, just to, want to. Just want to bring out there is a strong continuity between day and the revelation. If there's someone who's joining more recently and you see these symbols and they seem outlandish, um, these are keys. When you see the word leopard, bear, and lion, it's directing us directly back to a vision in Daniel in chapter 7 where the oppressive power, the antichrist power that would pers persecute God's people throughout the ages was identified. And now John and vision is being called back until that moment. I just want you to notice that. So there's a beast. You can call him an amalgamation. Notice he's not a normal creature. He has all these different forms. And the dragon is responsible for giving him his power, his seat, that word seat in Greek is important, his throne, his throne and great authority. Satan, when he's referred to as a dragon, that specifically keys in on Satan's power as the one who controls the, the the political heathen nations of the world. And that's why you see the dragon, Satan, being able to give a seat or a throne unto this beast. Amen. I do want to zero in on why the Bible says that this beast that he saw was like a leopard, right? And then it says he has feet of a bear and mouth of a lion. Like Pastor Burrell said, it is a combination of all of the different animals. But why are all the animals have leopard skin? Why are they wearing leopard skin? That is important. And it goes back to Egypt again. Egypt is important because it says, who is God that I should recognize him? In the ancient pharaohs, they had the priests, the priests of Ptah. These priests were said to be able to cast spells and they were able to speak to the gods on behalf of the people. They were also able to speak to the dead right? They promise that if they were able to do certain services, that they can grant you eternal life. The leopard skin was worn by the priests. The priests represented the church. The priests also spoke for the pharaohs. When the pharaoh died, there was a funeral service. At the funeral service, the priest would put a leopard, a dead leopard over his shoulder. If you can see in the picture, he puts it over his shoulder and he puts the mouth of the leopard over his heart. The priest would then put his hand up into the head of the, of the leopard and be able to move the leopard's mouth just like a ventriloquist. He was able, he told the people that he was able to accept offerings like this little hand that had the head of the leopard was able to absorb food or sacrifices or offerings. And he claimed that outside of this mouth that the dead Pharaoh could speak. He said the dead Pharaoh had become an ankh or a reanimated spirit. So even though if the Pharaoh was dead, the priest says that he can bring him back to life and speak through this head. The leopard was symbolic of the lion's swiftness and his spots represented the stars. Hence, Pharaoh again claimed to be Lord of the earth, the sky, and the Nile. This beast that is going to die, which is this seven-headed beast, is going to die. America, or this new beast that we're also going to see in Revelation, is going to claim to bring the beast back to life. And just like a ventriloquist, it is going to speak the same words of the first beast, right? Just like Egypt. 
John the Revelator knew these things and he's sending a code to the church. Remember, he's in prison. He's sending a letter out past the prison walls. He's using symbolism that is foreign to us, but understood by the church. All right. So let's pick up at verse three. Pastor Burrell. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered or marveled after the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So when we look at the vision that John is seeing in his own time, what he is seeing is that dragon, the dragon, Satan is working through the empire of Rome, Rome, political pagan Rome, that Rome would ultimately yield her power unto this beast, this anti-Christian power. That's what makes it different. That's what makes it unique. And so we see that it was pagan or political Rome that yielded her power to papal or religious Rome, okay? And what happened is that, is that after a certain period of time, and we've talked about this time, it's gonna come back in our chapter, 42 months, it's 1260 days, the beast suffered a deadly wound to one of its heads, namely the political power with which religious Rome ruled the whole world for more than a thousand years, it was taken away, namely by France, namely by France, that power was taken away, okay? But we're told that the day is coming when this wound would be healed, when this beast would come back with the fullness of power. And what's the purpose? Is so that everybody will worship Satan. Notice how Satan works. He has a representative. He has an emissary on earth. Uh, he always raises up these political kingdoms and through his political kingdoms, he does his best to claim the worship of God's creatures. That's what he has always wanted. That's what the great controversy is all about is Satan does not believe that God, the God of heaven and his son, Jesus Christ are worthy of worship. He believes that that belongs to him. So he sets up his nations on the earth. This is, this is what I call in prophecy, the counterfeit resurrection, right? You read the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see that Jesus Christ, the son of God ministered for three and a half years. He suffered a mortal wound. He was crucified. And what happened? He was raised back up. And at that moment, God said, let all the angels worship him. He was installed in heaven as high priest and king and received the adoration and praise of the heavenly host. Okay, in the same way, Satan's trying to counterfeit that his power ruled on earth for three and a half prophetic years, 1260 literal years. And after that period, it was slain or received a deadly wound, but that deadly wound is going, going to be healed. It's going to be a false resurrection of sorts. And then the whole world will marvel. And continuing in verse five, the Bible says there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given to him to continue. Here it is, 40 and two months. That's that figures. Sometimes 40 and two months, sometimes 1260 days, sometimes a time, times and a half a time. And uh, Elder Felder has helped us to understand this very well, that the Bible consistently talks about the same period of time, but it uses 1260 days when referring to God's people, when referring to the church, it uses this figure 42 months when referring to either the Gentile or evil or oppressive powers of this world. That was a very good insight that he brought out. Verse six says, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. This is important to understand. We've seen uh, this word blasphemy now three times in these two verses. Now, what is blasphemy? The Bible itself defines for us what blasphemy is. Uh, when Jesus was on earth, he healed a man of his paralysis. You'll remember that this man was lowered through the roof into the house where Jesus was preaching. But before he healed this man of his paralysis, he said unto the man, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And when he uttered those words, 
the scribes and the Pharisees grumbled and complained in their hearts and said, this man is blaspheming. He's claiming the power to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And that's why Jesus said that to, dis to demonstrate his divinity, his equality with God, okay? And so one definition of blasphemy is to claim the authority to forgive sins. A second definition of blasphemy is on another occasion when Jesus was preaching at the Feast of Dedication, John in chapter 10, he said, I and my father are one. And again, the Jews came to stone him and they said, you're committing blasphemy. You're claiming equality with God. Now for Jesus, it's not blasphemy because he is the son of God equal with his father. Okay. But for any other power, any other human, any other king to claim any equality with God is blasphemy. So what we see is that this power, it, it reigned for 1260 years. It's a blaspheming power and it claims the authority to forgive sins. It claims the authority to be equal with God, and it blasphemes God's name. That's his character. It blasphemes his tabernacle. And, and we've seen in the past how God's sanctuary in, illustrates his plan of salvation perfectly. And in this papal Roman religion that has a counterfeit for every element of God's sanctuary, for every truth in the plan of salvation, Rome has a counterfeit and also blasphemes those that dwell in heaven. The Bible calls those who belong in the church, those who are uh, seated with Christ above on high. I think I missed one verse. I just want to read that last verse, then we can get to this. I didn't want to skip over reading that, um, the, the next verse, verse seven, and it says, it was given unto him to make war with the saints, that's persecution, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So a worldwide power and also a persecuting power, language that is borrowed almost directly from the book of Daniel. Awesome. I, I just put up a picture that was just kind of emphasizing what you were saying about the blasphemy. Mm. Uh, this is just a quote from Pope Pius uh, the 11th on April 30th, 1922. He says, you know that I am the Holy Father, the representative of God on earth, the vicar of Christ, which means I am God on earth. That's a quote from Pope Pius the 11th. And we found in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, it says he will oppose and he will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself mm. to be God. The Bible calls, calls him the man of lawlessness or the man of sin that is doomed mm. to destruction. So that was just a wow. sort of supporting. Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. And this is very important for us. Listen very carefully. Everybody's going to worship this beast. And the Bible makes one exception. It says, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus made a covenant of peace with his father before the foundation of the world. That if the human race should fall into sin, he would give his life in place of ours. Amen. Salvation was not an afterthought. The plan was already laid. The only people that will be able to resist the power, the overwhelming authority of this beast, when he, when he rises again to take universal control, are those who have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, we saw in Revelation chapter 12 that the victors, the victors, the overcomers, overcome by the blood of the Lamb and their personal application of Christ dying and Christ living for them, the word of their testimony. And so Jesus says, if any man has an ear, let him hear. That's, that's, that's Jesus's way of saying, listen very carefully, understand what you just read. What he's calling us to is to understand this religious empire that would be developed and it would deceive the whole world. Remember, that's Satan's main weapon is deception. And so after a while, you know, paganism lost its effect idolatry, sexual immorality, self, uh, you know, very indulgent, luxurious lifestyles, that, that definitely has an effect upon men that causes them to depart from God. But Satan came up with a better plan. He said, what if I create a religious system that claims to worship God, that claims to be Christian, but I insert into this quote unquote Christian religion, all of my evil philosophies and errors and policies so that people are thinking they're convinced in their mind they're worshiping the true god of heaven they think that they're worshiping christ and the whole time 
they're actually believing the very lies that the devil teaches. So that is what is very important. Verse 10, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Talking about uh, the Pope of Rome who had taken so many people captive, so many of God's people captive, thrown them in dungeons, thrown them in prisons. His time was coming when he was going into that captivity. That's when he received his deadly wound. That's when General Berthier of France came and he marched into the Roman capital and took the Pope captive. And the Pope actually died in captivity. It says, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. In other words, now the tables were being turned. This persecuting power had killed many people. It was her turn to now die. And it says, here is the patience or the endurance and the faith of the saints. In other words, knowing this, Knowing this is what's going to help the saints to be patient or to endure and to maintain their faith in Jesus Christ. Here we are at verse 11, and it says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Mm. Well, and he exercises all of the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. So when America was formed, because this is right after the same time period, remember, uh, Pastor Morel was telling you about um, Napoleon and General Berthier. They sat down the Pope in 1798. They shut down the Vatican. And actually, mm. Napoleon went and put his own throne right there in the Vatican. So what nation was established right during that same period. America claimed this independence in 1776, but it was not acknowledged as a international uh, state until France acknowledged them in 1798. So France was the one that acknowledged them. And so by 1790, all 13 colonies have ratified the constitution. So that's this right. is the new power that's coming up. Look where it's coming up, right? Remember a beast is a nation. So we have a new nation and it's coming up out of the earth. All of the other powers up until now were coming up out of the sea. Those were populated places based on Revelation 17, 15. So here we have a, a place that is relatively unpopulated, right? Not a lot of, not a lot of uh, kings there, no, sorry, no kings there, no pope there. And then it has two horns like a lamb. What were the two horns that America had that made it unique and different from all of these European nations? People had freedom of religion. They had freedom of conscience. Uh, this was the only nation that comes up and has no king to rule over its uh, politics, and it has no pope to rule over its religion. But these two little horns were republicanism and Protestantism, meaning mm. a government that is a government of representation of the people, we call it democracy, and also Protestantism. We as a nation says that we have recognized what the papacy had done to all of God's people over all of these hundreds of years, and they wanted to stand firm on the truths of the Bible. This was an outgrowth of the people who moved from Europe coming to America seeking religious freedom. So these little lamb-like horns, these little baby horns, were the things that allowed America to be called the land of the free. People came from all over the world here to get freedom. Mm. Now, it's important that this, this nation as a lamb with little horns was representative of the bison or the buffalo or the, um, yeah, the bison that we had that rolled across the plain. Uh, give me a home where the buffalo roam and the deer and, you know. So we had buffalo, which is a symbol of the American animal. A buffalo, when it is a small baby with little horns, not very ferocious, not scary. Mm. But when a buffalo grows big and it becomes fierce, it will destroy you. So when we get to verse 12 and it says, and he exercises all the power of the first beast. Well, what power did the first beast have? The first beast had the power of Satan. Satan, remember the dragon gave the first beast his power? And so this one is also going to get satanic power. And what is it going to do? It is going to become a nation that says that I want to be like God. I want to control the religion as well as politics. And when that happens, it is a mirror image of the first beast. The Pope wanted to control the politics as well as the religion through one government. 
So the Bible says, and he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. What keeps the power of the papacy from running over America? It is Protestantism. It is freedom of religion. But when that goes away, and it is quickly, that means that that beast is going to get its power back. So as they take away our rights and privileges, has anybody looked at the news lately? Do you feel like your rights and privileges are slowly being taken away? That there's going to come a time that you won't have control over your own body? You will be punished for your own thoughts? Um, all of these things are going on. And before today's Bible study is over, we're going to show you what the Supreme Court says is the new position that America takes with regard to your freedoms and liberties. Um, mm. Anything you want to add before I go on to verse 13, Pastor Burrell? I just simply want to say that clearly we see a prophecy that the day of forced worship is coming. And I just want everybody on this line to be wise. State mandated religion will never be the answer, no matter how attractive it seems. It's never God's answer to mandate a religion throughout the state. Just be wise and understand that for yourself. Um, verse 13, and he doeth great wonders so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And mm. he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. And that image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, this mm. is thick. Bear with me as I go back through the text. Mm. Verse 13, and he that doeth great wonder so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Do you remember when we were in Revelation chapter 11, we had the two witnesses and the two witnesses represented Moses and Elijah. And mm -hmm. one of the things that they did that were miracles were they were able to call down fire from heaven. Remember Elijah called down fire from heaven. Moses also was able to call down hail and other sorts of things, hail that fell down as fire as part of the plagues on Egypt. Mm. This great nation will be able to do things that it would appear that only God can do. Miraculous things that we do through science and technology. Many things that appear to be science and technology had it been done in an earlier time period during the period of John, mm would have been called a miracle. We have dropped atom bombs and helium bombs and rocket ships. All of these kind of things are things that, that would be reserved for God. We call them miracles. Mm. And so it deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles, which they had power to do. If other nations see that you are able to do these things, they believe that you are more powerful and you should be given homage. When America says to do something, people do it. We can back it up with a rocket. With a press of a button, we can blow you off the planet. But it's not just physical power that this thing has. It's not mm. just physical power. It says, it deceiveth them that dwell on the earth. So they have physical power. And when it says deceiveth them, that is talking about spiritual power spiritual power right because it is the spiritual power that he uses to deceive what ways does america utilize spiritual power so in america we say that we are a protestant nation and one nation under god but we are the same nation that says it's okay to abort your babies mm. we are the same nation that that says you can't have prayer in school we are the same nation that says that we have come from apes and and swamp promatozoa. We teach evolution. We have even said that you can't teach creation in the school. These are spiritual attacks because when you separate people from the foundation of God's word, they are able to fall into other areas, right? And it says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Do you remember when I talked to you about the priest of Ptah? who was able to put his hand up into the leopard's mouth and be able to move it like a ventriloquist. And when he spoke, 
when the little hand spoke, it was really the priest speaking. The dead leper was not speaking. It was the priest speaking, but he was saying the exact same words that the Pharaoh would have said so that the people who saw when they heard the words, it sounded just like the Pharaoh who was the God man. Are you with me? And so we will have a priest class in America, modern day Protestant priests and, and pastors and such. They too will begin to speak just like the priest of Ptah. And the words that come out of their mouths will resemble what the papacy would say. They're gonna say, bring back religion in America again. We have gone astray and they will reinforce or enforce Sunday worship. Do you remember when the Pope first got his power? He got it from Emperor Constantine in the 300s. And the, one of the first things that Emperor Constantine did was enforce Sunday worship. That was one of the first signs uh, as we were able to recognize the papacy getting his power. There is going to come a time when this, this new beast, this lamb-like beast will also do what the first beast did, which is enforce Sunday worship, change God's day of worship from Sabbath, the seventh day, to Sunday, the first day. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking we already worship on Sunday, the first day. And many people do. But when the government tells you that you must worship on the first day, and if you don't, there will be consequences, then it will resemble what happened with Constantine mm -hmm. when he issued an edict of Milan that said, if you do not worship on Sunday, there will be civil penalties, there will be uh, fines and imprisonment, and ultimately there is a chance that you will lose your life. So when that happens in America, you will know that we have completely recreated the image of the beast. Pastor Burrell? I just wanna talk about quickly the fire coming down from heaven and the spiritual state of America. Okay, we see fire coming down from heaven, like Brother Felder said in Elijah's time, he called down fire from heaven to say what? That his worship, that his sacrifice was accepted. So that's one of the deceptions of the last days is, is you see so many churches that don't give attention to God's law. They don't give attention to God's prophetic message. They don't accept the truths of the Bible, but they look large. They look prosperous. They look as if they are accepted of God, okay? Another time in the Bible you see fire coming down from heaven was upon the heads of the apostles on the day of Pentecost. That was the true indication, a true manifestation of the Holy Spirit empowering their message, empowering their mission. And so, so what we see here is that in the last days in America, you'll have so many churches that are large, that are prosperous, that are, that are popular, but they'll be teaching lies. The most famous pastors in this country do not teach the truth. The vast majority of, 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 the vast majority of, of men you see standing up on TV with a Bible in their hand are not actually telling you the truth of what that Bible says. And what this has the effect of, it has the effect of saying, oh, God accepts them. This is the true move of the Holy Spirit, but it has nothing to do. Not to mention the, million of, uh, the millions of American Protestants who go to church week after week seeking some hyper-spiritualized, emotionalized form of worship. Everybody wants to raise their hands and get caught up in this trans-like state of worship that the Bible never, absolutely never condones. You never see them worshiping that way in the Bible, but they don't want to hear the plainest truths coming out of the word of God. They don't want to surrender their will unto God to obey his commandments. They don't want to fulfill what Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. They just want to get caught up in this emotionalistic, sensationalistic euphoria, ecstasy of what we now call quote unquote worship. And, and I believe that's what's largely being referred to this false kind of protestantism and as brother felder said you know in the end of the day you look like your parent so 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 ultimately what's going to happen is that is that america is going to look more and more like rome and the oppression she enforced especially when she legislated or mandated worship throughout the civil power throughout the state is going to have that image and it's going to cause that word cause is very clear in greek it literally means to force to force worship even in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I just want to bring up one point that I thought you did a great job on. 
we had talked about, you said these mega churches, and I think people want to judge the quality of the religion based on the size of the church. In Daniel chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar told everyone to bow down and everyone bowed except for three boys. If you were going by the numbers, you would say that everyone who bowed down must be right because everyone is doing it. When you look at the ark, there were only eight who got on. You would say by the numbers that so many people stayed off and those eight got it right and everybody else got it wrong. You better be careful judging your religion with God by the numbers. I'll leave it there. Let's go on to- Can I say, well, I'm sorry, brother. Can I say yeah. one more thing? Come I want to say that, I, but this needs to be said. In Daniel chapter three, we see the foreshadowing of this time. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he built this whole uh, statue and commanded all the people to come worship. And what did he use to get people to worship his statue? He used music. He used music. And in Revelation, what we're reading now, it says that it says the second beast will use fire. Well, part of that hyper-spiritualized, charismatic form of worship is the use of what is now called contemporary gospel music or contemporary Christian music and all this quote-unquote praise and worship music to induce people into this trans-like state where they're not thinking, they're not actually hearing and believing the words of God. They're just seeking after a feeling. And Satan uses that, as he says, Monica say, to lull people to sleep so that they're not actually trusting in Jesus with the living faith and obeying the words of God from their hearts. So just pay attention, brothers and sisters. This is very, very important. Do not let any man deceive you. Awesome. And when they're playing that music, they're saying that the Holy Spirit is falling. You better be That's careful. That's right. You be careful those spirits that are coming down. You better compare that to what, what, what went on in the Bible. Uh, let's go to verse 16. Verse 16. Revelation 13, 16. This is a good Bible study. We easing through it. There's a lot of stuff here. Verse 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Look at this. Everybody's included. Small and great, right? I don't care if you're important or unimportant. Rich and poor. So you, you're the gates or the homeless guy. You're covered and then mm. free and bond. Whether you imprisoned, whether you owe debts to people, everybody is covered, right? Just like in, in Daniel 3, everybody, everybody is covered. And it says, verse 17, and no man might buy or sell so that he who had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Mm. Commerce is important. We are in a world system right now that that if you don't do certain things, even now, you may not be able to buy or sell or fly or get a license, et cetera. You can easily see how quickly government action can, can change the sway of, of your rights and what you perceive as your privileges. Verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him that understandeth count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his mm. number is six hundred. Three score and six. Mm. I'm going to try to run down some things quickly. Uh, Pastor Morell, I, I'll, if you want to talk about it first, you're more than welcome. But otherwise, I'm going to give you a quick rundown. And I'm sure. Uh, Go Pastor, ahead, brother. All right. Here, we're going to try to capture the 666. Stay with me for a minute. Is this mark physical? This 666, right? I'm just dealing with the mark. We, we, got, we, got, a, we got a mark. We got a number. Uh, and we have his name. We know the name of, of the beast, right? The name is blasphemy. Remember, we talked about that. Blasphemy is say that you're God, able to forgive sins, change a Sabbath day, the list goes on and on. But what about the mark? Is the mark physical? When we look at Revelation 14, 9, this mark is important. When we get to Revelation 14, it says, uh, and the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand. So it's two different places. You can get it in your, your head, means your mind, or in your hand, which means by your actions. Sometimes we do things because we need to feed our families, right? People say, well, what, what do I do if this happens? Or if they command this, then I gotta eat, you know? Well, that you're doing it because that's your hand. You're doing it because, because you're, you're, you're trying to take care of some physical need. And other people, will follow this mark because of their mind, meaning they believe that it's right. 
they side with this view or this opinion. It is their same opinion. Nobody is forcing or coercing them. Mm. Look at Hebrews 10, 16, and it talks about what, it, what the forehead means, right? The forehead means mine. Um, Hebrews 10, 16, it says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them, Amen. right? So mine Amen. means in your brain, your medulla mm. oblongata, right? Your frontal lobe where you make all of your critical decisions. And then what about the hand? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9, 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do with all thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Also, with regard to the number, i am kind of do some high-level overview because I know Pastor Burrell is going to come behind me, and I know we got some time, some little time concerns. We might go a little over today. Stay with me, though. The beast also has a name. This beast says that he, or this power says that he is the son of God. Literally, he stands in the place of God. He is the representative of the son of God. Vicarious filii dii. These are titles of the Roman Catholic Church. They all add up to 666. Now, just because it adds up to 666, you're saying, well, that don't mean that he's the beast power, right? Because Ronald Reagan adds up to 666. For all I know, my number might add up to 666. But let's look at all of the, the critical factors. The, the Bible gives us 10 critical factors, and this number is just one to help you zero in on who the beast is. All right, are you with me? So these are all of the official names of the papacy. It, Italica Ecclesia, which in, 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 in most of these systems, every name, every letter stood for a number. Mm. So the official name in Italian or in Latin is the Italian church. That is its official name. Um, its actual title is Vicar of God's Son, Vicarious Filii Dea, and the numbers add up to 666. Uh, it's also called the head of the clergy, which is ducks clergy. When you take the numbers and you add them up, because the numbers, uh, the letter stood for numbers, it acts, uh, adds to um, 666 as well, head of the clergy. In Greek, it's called the Latin kingdom. It added up to 666. And it's Greek. Uh, in Greek, it is called the Latin speaking man, which is Latinos. Mm. All added up to 666. But what does the church say? Does the church also take those titles? Does it reaffirm what I just said to you? In the beast's own words, in the beast's own words, this is what it says. It says, as the blessed Peter was constituted vicar of the son of God on earth, so it has been seen that the pontiffs, his successors, hold for us an empire, our empire, the power of supremacy on earth, greater than the clemency of our earthly imperial serenity. This comes from Our Sunday Visitor, an official Jesuit publication in November 15, 1914. It says, the title of the Pope of Rome is Vicarious Filii Dei. This is inscribed on his mitre. And if you take the letters of the title and add them together, it comes to 666, mm. right? So this is their official title, comes from their official church. I thought that might be important. Let's move forward. I'm going to put some comments up. Um, so the beast causes the followers to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell without the mark or the name or the number of the mm -hmm. first. Beast. So the mark of the beast will be the observance of a religious law enforced by the United States and other governments. So the religious people in this country, the Protestant people, will begin to follow and act just like the papacy. The movement is currently called ecumenicism. It means that they are coming back to the mother church. Rome is the mother church. And it says all other churches are its daughter, mm. right? So these other churches, these daughter churches already have the major portion of the mark, which is Sunday observance. What would make it the mark of the beast is when it adds a death decree to it, right? So this mark is Satan's counterfeit of God's seal. God places his seal on the forehead of his people. So he says that in the book of Exodus, when the priests were commanded, they were supposed to have the, the father's name literally on their forehead. You were supposed to be able to look at them and be able to see that they are God's people. Now, I believe it is significant that it's on its forehead because I can't read your mind, but if something is on your forehead, I can see how you act, right? So it's not a literal mark, 
but by your conduct, it will be obvious. Just like this beast power goes on your forehead by your conduct, it will be obvious. So God's seal is his name, his character, and his law written in people's hearts. Mm. So there are going to be a lot of people who keep Sabbath. They're going to keep the seven-day Sabbath, but they don't have God's character in their hearts, right? So you remember when they crucified Christ, they were keeping Sabbath. The, the, the Pharisees, nobody kept Sabbath better than them. The other thing is that these were the representatives of the church. Just because they're in church or they hold a title in church doesn't mean that they're doing God's will. Right, So those things are critical. In Revelation 14, 12, it says that those who resist the mark of the beast are those who keep the commandments of God, meaning that you are willing to do those commandments. And there, there are 10 simple commandments, but there are laws, je um, judgments, and statutes that expound upon those original 10. And a, they have the faith of Jesus, not faith in Jesus, it's faith of Jesus, which means that they did or believe the way Jesus believed, right? Faith of Jesus, the same kind of faith, the same, the same way that Jesus would have acted in a particular circumstance and relied on his father uh, and had faith in his father to, to do his will. It's faith of Jesus, not just faith in Jesus, all right? So Pastor Rell, let me turn it over to you. I know you have some comments and then I'll come back whenever you're done. Well, brothers and sisters, you know, this, everybody's interested in this 666. Um, First of all, notice that it is not just 666. It is specifically 666. And, and we know how we talk in our modern language. When we think we have somebody figured out, we'll say, I got your number, right? It's like you, you understand what makes somebody tick. Uh, uh, the Bible here is trying to help us to understand what is it that makes this beast power tick? I, I, I want you to recognize here that there is a, a deeper layer of this, of, of this number because yes, the Pope's title, Vicarious Philae Dei, or the Vicar of the Son of God, we see it adds up to 603 score and six. But notice, this is the number of the beast, it's the number of a man, and it's also called the number of his name. It's something that we can receive. It's something that an individual can receive. And you'll say, well, I'm not the Pope of Rome. I'm not running around here calling myself uh, the Vicar or the representative of the Son of God. So, so, so what is 666 as it applies to us and us not receiving it? In Revelation 15 and verse 2, you're going to see there's a group and the Bible says they have the victory. They have the victory over the number of his name and over the name of the beast. So I, I just want you to notice it says here is wisdom. Wisdom in the Bible always means applied knowledge or putting the truth into practice. So this detail that John gives us was not only to give us a, a final nail in the coffin to identify this beast for who he really is, but also we have to put this truth into practice. In the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you know this, if you're still going to give into the powers that be. That's what wisdom is. You put your knowledge into practice. And also in the Bible, it's important to understand that name means character. So when you talk about the number of somebody's name, you're talking about the identifying mark of their character. You know, we use numbers to identify ourselves. Uh, a person in prison will have an inmate number. We have social security numbers. You, your home has a house number, your address. So we understand the idea of a number as an identifying mark. And name in the Bible means a person's character or reputation. So so it's a, it's a, it's a spiritual mark as, as we lay it out. It's not a, a physical tattoo. Don't worry. It's, it, I'm, I'm not saying they're not doing this, but if they are inserting a microchip into the COVID-19 vaccine, it's not that the serial number on the microchip is 666. That, that's not what the Bible is talking here. It, it's talking about a spiritual mark that signifies or identifies that a person measures up to the character of the beast. And here's, here's a very important practical point for us. We see 666 somewhere else in the Bible. 666 talents of gold was the average weight of gold that Solomon collected yearly at the height of his prosperity. Now, in our terms today, uh, that is 25 tons of, of, or, of gold, or let's make it real for us. That's $1.2 billion in gold that Solomon was earning every year. It, 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 this was his identifying mark 
as the king that made Israel so wealthy and so materially prosperous. He collected 660 cents talents of gold. This wasn't just one year. This was his average amount of gold that he brought into the country. And you see that in 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 14. So now the question is, how was Solomon able to gain this wealth? Did Solomon gain his wealth by being faithful to God? Well, uh, unfortunately, the answer is no, because in Deuteronomy in 17, Deuteronomy in 17, God gave explicit instructions unto those men who would become his kings. Now, God never wanted his people to have a king, but he says, look, when you go ahead and get yourself a king, make sure he does not multiply horses for himself. Make sure he does not cause the people to return to Egypt. Make sure he does not multiply wives for himself, for they'll turn his heart away. And make sure he does not multiply for himself excess silver and gold. You see, the king of Israel was not to be focused on strengthening his military. That's horses. He was not supposed to be mixing in with the world or bringing the people back to the religion and the errors of Egypt. He was not supposed to be uh, immoral, having all these women, all these wives, and was not supposed to be indulgent with a luxurious life of silver and gold. That was not the purpose of the king of Israel. Unfortunately, the biblical record tells us that Solomon violated each of these commands to make himself uh, and his nation materially prosperous. You see, Solomon strengthened his military by multiplying horses from himself. And he specifically went down to Egypt to get his horses like God told him not to. Early, excuse me, early on in his reign, Solomon made an alliance. He made a peace treaty with the king of Egypt and married his daughter. And through his daughter, she was bringing the idolatrous practices of the Egyptians into Israel. Everything that God said not to do, that's what Solomon did. He definitely multiplied wives unto himself. 1 Kings 11 verse 1 says that Solomon loved many strange women. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Brothers, I love my wife, but I couldn't imagine having a thousand of them. Amen. But he, he, he broke this command, this plain command of God. Everything that God said don't do, he did. And obviously, we see that Solomon multiplied excessive amounts of gold and silver to himself. Like I said, $1.2 billion. A lot of us can't conceive that. That's a lot of money. That's just in gold. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Solomon uh, uh, got so much gold in the nation of, of Israel. It says that all of his drinking cups were made out of gold. None of his cups were made out of silver because silver was accounted as nothing in the time of Solomon. Silver was virtually worthless because he had that much gold. So the point is, when you look at Solomon's identifying mark, the amount of gold that he brought in every year is that Solomon gained wealth. He gained his massive wealth and his material prosperity through compromise. Because a lot of us say, man, I know this truth about Sunday worship. When I see them trying to legislate that, I'll just make sure not to do it. But notice, they're going to force men and women not to be able to buy or sell. They're going to cut off every earthly form of support. So, so, so how is the beast going to drag everybody into his net? Well, notice Solomon disregarded God's commandments, direct commandments for worldly advantages. 600, three score and six will be the identifying mark, the number of everyone who disregards God's Sabbath commandment when this test comes to hold on to their money their material possessions, their resources, their comfort. So it's like Satan has an assembly line. And when, he, when he's shooting people out of his assembly line, he's stamping them with his serial number. This is the number of the character, the measure of the character of the beast, right? We see that the time is coming when no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So notice the number of the name is not just what the Pope has inscribed on the inside of his crown, it's something that we can receive or something that we must resist. Uh, 600, three score and six will be stamped upon people that recognize their obligation to obey God's laws, including his fourth commandment Sabbath, but choose to take the easy compromising road and keep their material wealth in check. I find it very interesting that when Jesus gives this principle, he says, no man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, 
or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He specifically says you can't serve both God and money. God knows the, the natural attraction and power that money has over the human heart to the point where 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It's going to be one of the most severe tests in the last days because money is connected to everything, brothers and sisters. It's not just for rich people who live luxurious lifestyles, lavish lifestyles. No, your money is your shelter. Your money is your clothes. Your money is your food. Your money is your ability to feed your family. And so Satan knows that for people who have some principles in their brain to say, I know the truth. The Bible says the Sabbath is the, is the seventh day. I'm not going to deal with the first day. Satan's going to start pulling on other aspects of your character. And God is saying, don't wear this mark of 600, three score and six. Don't follow the path of Solomon. Don't multiply horses. That is, don't trust your material possessions for ultimate security. Don't unite with Egypt. That is, don't unite with the world in its habits and practices. The things of this world are not of the Father. We can't love God and love this world. Uh, if we are friends with the world, we are enemies of God. Don't engage with strange women. That is, don't engage with these churches that don't accept God's true Sabbath or his prophetic message. Don't multiply wise. And then finally, don't multiply gold. Don't make it your aim and purpose to live a life of excessive ease and luxury. All these things are idols that will only lead you to violate conscience in order to protect a comfortable, easy, luxurious lifestyle. And finally, I just want to bring this out, Brother Felder. What was the message? And this, can, this is a precursor for tomorrow. What was the message that led Solomon to repent of his compromise? Well, we see Solomon's journey of repentance because praise God, he was ultimately saved. His journey of repentance is recorded in the book of Ecclesiastes. I want you to hear this loud and clear, brothers and sisters. In the book of Ecclesiastes, he ends it by saying this, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, listen to that, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Why? For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil. You see, Solomon was led to repentance from his compromising worldly life that led to, to great er earthly wealth. He was led to repentance by the message that said, fear God for the hour of his judgment is coming. And I find it very interesting. The message will be given in the last days. We will see tomorrow that will act as a vaccine against the number of the beast and the number of his name. The message that led Solomon to repent was fear God for the hour of his judgment is coming. Tomorrow we will see in Revelation 14 verse 7, the message that will protect us against this compromise that will have us stamped with this number uh, is the message in Revelation 14 7, fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come. In Solomon's day, he said, look, God shall bring every work into judgment. Brothers and sisters, we live in a time where the hour of his judgment is come. He is examining our lives. He is bringing every work into judgment, present tense. You see, it's an awareness that we are presently living under the final judgment that will keep a person sober, clear-minded, and free from excesses that lead to being marked or numbered by the beast name that is his character. Ultimately, don't let the devil stamp you. The whole book of Revelation is, is getting us to the point that says either God will complete his work in your life and he will sign you with his signature. Or if we're not united to God by living faith, not yielded and surrendered to him, Satan is working in our lives so he can bring us to this point and shoot us through his assembly line and stamp us with his mark. So don't give into it, brothers and sisters. We must have the victory through Jesus Christ. And we'll see very clearly tomorrow the message that leads us to that victory. We must have the victory over the number of his name. Amen. Amen. Um, I just want to, I love the way you talked about how Solomon and the gold and 660, 666 was important. His 666 pounds of, of gold that he brought in. But we found 666 someplace else in the Bible as well. If you remember from Daniel mm. chapter 3, verse 1, mm. in Babylon, it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold 
whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof was six cubits. Mm. And he set it in the plain of Dora in the providence of Babylon. So those mm. who, who took, um, I think it's geometry, that if they give you the height and the breadth, then you know that the depth of it would equal the same. And that's how you get six, mm. six, six. So this number is a number that doesn't come from one of God's numbers. We know God's numbers. We've been going through them over and over again. Seven mean completion. We've been talking about 12 is his government. Um, we know that we talked about the four corners that mean every single direction. But here, this number six, if you remember the creation story, six was the number of man. Remember yeah. Pastor Morel was saying that seven is greater than six and you got to choose seven and not six because if you stop at six, you haven't completed all the way to God. But 666 means man above, man on the surface, and man below. Man, 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 no place for God if it's all men. Now, this 666, remember John is sending this letter, is a secret code that he's sending out to the prison. He's sending it out of the prison. It's got to go past the guards. 666 also po pointed back to Babylonian sun worship. So the priests of Babylon would wear amulets on their chests. And these amulets would have numbers on them, numbers. And the numbers on these amulets, when they were added up in any direction, just like Sudoku, mm. added it up this way or that way or down, up, right, it would always equal 111. And if you added the six rows together, it would equal 666. Mm. That is what the priests wore. They also believed in numerology. They believed that the only numbers that they used was one to 36. It represented different parts of the zodiac, right? It, they believed that it allowed them to tell the future, these Babylonian priests, right? So this 666, John is telling them that this beast power is connected to the same religion that came from Babylon. He is tying it up for the believers. This 666 is critical because we remember from an earlier Bible study that when Rome was established on its main mountain mm. called Vaticanus, that is where the priest of Saturn that came from Babylon ultimately settled. So the priesthood from Rome is nothing more than a continuation of the priest in Babylon. The College of Cardinals is not a Roman invention. The red, the red capes, remember we mm. talked about those red capes and the purple mm. capes? That's from Babylon. If you were given a red cape, it meant that you were a prince of Babylon. Do you remember when they tried to give Nebu um, they tried to give Daniel a gold chain? Remember a gold chain and a red cape? Mm. Signify that he was a priest in Babylon or that he was a mighty man in Babylon. So that's what the papacy wears now. If you look at wow. the cardinals and you look at the bishops, they wear the red cape. But this is important, something else that we got to touch on. I know we're a few minutes over, but bear with me. Mm. These same priests of Babylon that wore these solar sigiluses, mm. the, that was the, the number, uh, these number amulets on their chest, it also represented that they held the keys of Jupiter, right? The keys of Saturn, the keys of life and death. It also signified that they were the Peter. Peter meant interpreter. They were able to interpret for the people the, the messages that came from the gods. They were mm -hmm. the spokespersons for the gods. When the papacy became Christianized. Remember when, when Constantine became a Christian and he, the papacy becomes a Christianized form of paganism? It too claimed to be the Peter. Remember it says that it has the keys of Peter? Well, it uses the same word. It, had, it sounds the same way, but it's a different word. It is the Peter. They believe that they, they, they are telling you one way that they get their power from the apostle Peter. But the ancient word Peter means spokesperson for the gods, right? So it is a religion that looks one way on the outside, mm. but only mm. people who are initiated understand what's going on wow. on the inside. So wow. we got to be careful, man. You got to be careful. Uh, now, I just want to narrow this thing out quickly. Again, everybody says, how do you know mm. that the papacy is tied up with this 666, right? Remember I told you my name, my number can equal 666. 
it doesn't. <laughs> but here's some things that you want to capture from today's Bible study. Uh, the first thing that it is a political kingdom because it is a beast, right? This also shows that the Antichrist will not be an individual person, but a political entity. So mm. not one particular pope, right? They are kings. Right, right. They are kings. These popes are kings. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get to Revelation 18. So it's, it's, a, it's a line of kings. It arises amid the numerous people, which is the sea. The papacy is called the papal sea, S-E-E. -E, but the Bible says that sea means it covers nations and languages and people and tongues, etc. Do you remember, just like I said, the Peter speaks for the gods? They said that they got their throne from Peter. Same, same, um, same, I'm looking for the right, phonetics. It's the same phonetics. So this papal sea sits over nations and kingdoms, etc. Number three, it is one of the seven political powers or empires opposed to God. Remember, we went down the line of the seven, seven kingdoms. We started with Egypt and Assyria and then Babylon, so forth and so on. And it comes from the um, pagan Rome. So it's one of those seven powers that it's connected to. Number four, it is connected with Western Europe. Remember, it comes from the 10 horns. And if you're watching online, take a picture of this because you never want people to say, oh, they just kind of willy-nilly came up with 666. God gives you a, a roadmap that you can't miss it, right? It disqualifies every other power on the planet. Mm. Number, number four, it is connected with Western Europe. Initially, it comes from the 10 horns and Daniel and Revelation and are in reference to the divisions of Western Rome. Number five, it reigns while the powers of Western Europe rule. So mm. these crowns are upon its head. Remember, you got crowns? Uh, it is connected with the four kingdoms of Daniel 7. Babylon and their religion imputes wisdom and power unto the false gods. Media and, and Persia added a tyrannic, uh, tyrannic, tyrannical sort of force. They were the absolute monarchs. So these are different elements. Remember, it had the, the head like Babylon. So there it got wisdom and power of false gods. And then from the Medes and the Persians, it was an absolute monarchy. Remember Daniel was thrown into the lines then if he wouldn't pray to anybody else uh, but the king. And then Greece, it brings them philosophy. You got to be careful with this Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy says that we can reason our way to heaven. Mercy. You got to be careful when somebody got so many degrees that they make this Bible so you can't understand it. That mm -hmm. is a trick. You know, in a lot of places where they send ministers off to be educated, the Bible is not the main literature that they're learning from. They are learning Mercy. from human philosophy. Mercy. You be careful when people are breaking it down in so many, they, they, they break it down to the original language and they use so many words that is that is not understandable. This Bible is made so a child can understand it. Do you remember when Christ was talking? He was talking to the poor. He was talking to the unlearned. He made it so they can understand this word. Don't ever let somebody tell you that you cannot study this word for yourself and with prayer and fasting that God will not lead you to his truths. I, if you don't remember anything else that I said today, I want you to remember that. God will make his word clear. If you are sincere and you get into this word with prayer and fasting and a true desire to understand it, he will make it clear. All right, uh, number seven, it's seat, power, and the great authority came from Imperial Rome. And, and right. the pastor already explained to us what a seat was. It is a universal power. That is what the word Catholic means. It means universal. That's it's right. worldwide. Uh, it practices blasphemy. Blasphemy on a regular basis. It tells people that they have forgiven their sins. Mm. It says that when it forgives people's sins, it forgives it in the same way God is able to forgive sins. Mercy. It's not a lesser forgiveness. You can pay money and it'll call mama and daddy out of, out of um, purgatory. These are the things that it declares. Its number is 666. And every way that the number is broken down, it is 666. In right. Greek, Latin, Hebrew, whatever other language is 666. Its political supremacy is for 1,260 years or 42 prophetic months. That is the dark ages of the papacy. It received a deadly wound. Remember 1798, Pastor Burrell told you that uh, Napoleon and, and uh, General Berthier took the the Pope off of his throne. Um, it received a deadly wound. The wound is healed. In 1920 or 1929 or thereabouts, um, Rome or the Vatican received its power back, right? The, the Italian government, uh, Benito Mussolini gives power back over to the Vatican. 
they are reestablished and they even pay them reparations for the time period that their government was shut down. Mm. It is now a government. It is the smallest nation in the world. It sits before the United Nations. And even when the Pope comes here, the entire United States government did something that is never done. Mm. We have both parties represented it. All the congressmen, all of the senators, the Supreme Court justices, all of the cabinet ministers, and even the president of the United States soot, sat down Amazing. to hear what the Pope had to say. We have Amazing. never done that for any other world leader. It is telling Amazing. you the power of this man. Do not be deceived. The Bible says it will be restored to its world preeminence. Lastly, as I close, I know you're still trying to say, what does it have to do with me today? I'm just trying to keep my lights on. Well, what does the Supreme Court say? Mm -hmm. This is the religious news service of July 22nd, 1983. It says, this United States Supreme Court has fundamentally changed the ground rules for separating church and state, that the state may justify a limitation on religious liberty by showing that it is essential to accomplish an overriding governmental interest. So if the government decides that whatever your religious beliefs are, whether it is taking shots or not aborting babies or whatever it is, if it goes against a government interest, the government interest wins, right? Whatever that thing may be. Here's a, um, another quote. It says, because Sunday is the Sabbath of the majority in our land, meaning America, and has, been, and has been nationally established as a day of worship, it is the day that all should be compelled to observe as the Lord's day. And we further emphasize that it is the duty of the government to enforce the observance of that day. This comes from a religious publication in 1983, made up of many of the religious leaders in Protestant denominations. So they're saying that the government has a duty to enforce Sunday worship, all right? Mm. What does um, Justice Scalia said uh, from the Supreme Court? He declared that when, re when, religious, when religious rights clash with the government's need for uniform rules, the court will side with the government. Hmm. The court will side with the government. He says religious adherents need to look to the political system, not to the courts for protection. These are modern rulings. He said the Supreme Court today forcefully declared that it will no longer shield believers whose practices violate general laws. Hmm. So that means that if you want to stick with the law of the Bible and it says keep seven and the government says keep one, the Supreme Court will not protect you from that. Right? These days of protection are going to come to an end. The world is going to cry out for Sunday. The world is going to cry out for the papacy because the world is going to be turned upside down and people are going to believe that it is time to turn back to God. Mm. And when they do that, what God are they going to turn back to and what laws become significant? The ones that God puts up or the one that man puts up? Uh, here's from former Chief Justice William Rehnquist. He says this: the problem with the Smith decision, and that's a case we won't get into, but it says, is that the United States Supreme Court has gutted the free exercise of the First Amendment, which mm. is freedom of religion. He also says that the wall of separation between church and state should be frankly and explicitly abandoned. He said it makes it difficult for the court. Just get mm. rid of the, the separation. Recently, during the era of President Trump, they got rid of what, what is known as the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment kept churches from making political donations to political parties. And once that is done away with, if my church has more money than your church, I can buy more politicians than you. And the politicians will work for me. Mercy. But if my religion doesn't line up with your religion and the government is siding with me, then guess what? You're in trouble. That's what happened to the three boys, the three Hebrew boys on the plane of Dora. The politics and the religion was on one side because they supported each other, but it didn't support the religion that put God first. All right, mm -hmm. last slide and we're done. The Protestant church in America has, has, is steeped in apostasy. And further, the Protestant churches have begun to unite with the Catholic church. They are looking for one world religion, one religion, one religion, one banking system, one currency, one leader, Everything is going back to one, just like it was when Nimrod created the Tower of Babel. One language, one religion, one government, one leader.
So that's where we're headed to, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. And that's what today's Bible study was all about. You have to choose a side. And if you don't choose a side, you have already chosen. If you don't choose a side, one will be chosen for you. The man said, I'm not on that side of the fence or on that side of the fence. I'm standing on the fence. The response was, somebody owns the fence. That's right. Come on. All right. We're done. We'll take one or two comments. I know it's 725. We'll take one or two comments. We will pray and we will land the plane. And Pastor Morel, of course, if you have any final comments, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, but let's look at a few of the, the, the comments that are on the thread. Pastor Morel, were there any that stood out for you? Um, yes, yes. Sister uh, Sandra says, Acts 5, 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And that's just the fundamental principle, brothers and sisters. We need the courage of Jesus Christ to stand against whatever the world powers might throw. And also Sister Monica says something very powerful. She says, it will be too late for those who profess to have the name of the Lord. Probation will have clothes for the ones in the house of the Lord. Take this very seriously. If you're hearing this truth, you may not have known this up until now. This may not be truth that your parents or previous generations recognize. Well, God judges each individual. He's a very faithful and just judge. He judges us on the light we have. So if you're receiving this light now, that means God is calling you to decide to stand with him. And we got to make up our mind now. Every day we wait, it just makes it harder and harder to make decisions to yield our lives over to Jesus Christ. This is very important, brothers and sisters. I heard, I heard explanations of 666 that I never heard. And, and, and the thing is, all roads lead back to Rome. All roads lead back. No matter how you identify the mark, it's still pointing to this Babylonian false church, state, religion, power. And I just want to say your only hope is in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Only he can detach you from a love of self, a love of money, a love of this world, the fear and pressure that will cause a person to compromise, even something they don't really believe in. Only Christ can save you. You have to let him be saving and sanctifying you even right now. Brother Felder, do you have uh, some comments from the social media feed for us? I just want to add two comments. Um, and, and, and then I'll add one more thing for tomorrow. We need to talk about what's coming tomorrow because it's going to be some stuff. Monica says, we're to see world events through the lens of prophecy and run to warn truth seekers to lead them to righteousness and work with zeal as to those who know not the times of the earth. Mm. I remember early on, Pastor Burrell, when we were doing Daniel, you said that the tribe of Issachar was important because they were able to identify the times. That's right. We are living in the world that people don't want to know what time we're in. Mercy. They say that they are awoke, but they're asleep. They're sleepwalking. Mm. They don't know the time. There are people saying, I don't want to study Daniel and Revelation. It's the only book, Revelation, that says that there's a blessing in it for reading and hearing and doing it because it's telling you what is about to happen to you. The only place that you're going to find truth is in the word of God, not on CNN. You know, it's fake news. <laughs> yeah, some of it is true, but the truth of the matter is, is not going to lead you to the ultimate truth. Are you with me? So yeah. that's why we have to study this word. Let me give you one more quote. It says the reason that all of these statements and rulings, this is from Miss Melody. She says the reason of all of these statements and rulings that have occurred are important is because the last movements will be rapid. The groundwork has already been laid. The groundwork has already been laid. There are a lot of people on this line who are listening today who, who you already understand Sabbath. But if you understand Sabbath and you don't understand the God of the Sabbath, Mm. You don't have the seal, his character and his nature and all of those things that go along with the truths of his word and also treat people with the fruits of the spirit, then Sabbath won't save you. Remember, I told you the true Israelites or the original Israelites of the Bible, the ones that that put Christ on the cross, they knew how to say his name. They knew how to speak Hebrew. Are you with me? They knew his race. They knew where he came from. They knew Sabbath. They knew all of the commandments. They knew all of that, but they didn't know Christ. Mercy. Don't miss it, man. Mercy. You know, Christ said to the Pharisees, this you should have done, but the other things you should not have left undone. You mm -hmm. Both of them are important. With that, let's close in prayer. Pastor Burrell, if you could be so kind. Also, tomorrow we are on Revelation 14, Revelation 14, and it is three more trumpets 
three more messages, three more messages that will go out to the world. And that is what God's people are supposed to be doing right now. Not social media, not, not all of these other things that we're caught up into. We are supposed to sound an alarm. We're supposed to be ringing an alarm bell right now. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about that alarm that we are supposed to be doing in response to what the beast is doing. We know what he's doing, but God is still on the throne and he's going to get his word out. And the question is, will you be an alarm for Christ? Pastor Burrell? Amen. Let us pray, family. Father in heaven, you're so gracious to make this truth plain. Thank you for the truth that will set us free if we believe it, if we surrender it to it. Thank you for your word, which is truth, which sanctifies us. We just thank you. You're so gracious. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending him to live a sinless life, to die in our place and raised him up to seat him as our high priest where he represents us. Help us to claim all the power available to us in Christ. Father, I just rebuke the evil spirit that would have an individual say, oh, this is not important. Uh, this, this can't be it. Lord, help that person to see that Satan got Eve to eat a piece of fruit and brought all this degradation and woe upon the human race. Father, I just want to rebuke the evil spirit. Uh, somebody who wants to say, oh, this is a, a religious fanaticism and excitement. Lord, help them to see, see that this is just plain. This is clear. In the past, governments have always risen to the point where they thought they could control the masses through worship. And that's when they get humbled to the dust, that's that's when you step in to shut them down. Lord, help us to see that it's coming right to our front doorstep, as it were. We are going to have to be prepared to stand. Help us to see that it's only by the blood of the lamb that we overcome. Help us all to be focusing our hearts, hopes, and our attention and our affections upon Jesus Christ. Father, my simple prayer is that we would experience the full salvation bought, paid for, and prayed for in Jesus Christ, that we would be set free, that we would be sanctified, and that we would be sealed. Father, give us a more intense desire and commitment to want to come and be home with you and help us to live our life, make decisions accordingly. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen, and amen again. Thank you so much, Pastor Burrell. Remember everybody, all Revelation is all about is worship. It is about worship. So uh, today as we close, my name is Thomas Felder. On behalf of myself, um, my wife, Melody, Pastor Anthony Burrell and Mr. Cordell Dormer, who spent a lot of time working on our slides, grateful for that. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. What would it profit us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul? Mm. And to greet you and greet you, walk with the king today and be a blessing. Today's Bible study is a officially over. We'll see you tomorrow as we come back with Revelation 14. God bless.